Welcome to the Arlington Street Church podcast. Founded in 1729, Arlington Street continues today as a gathering place for progressive people of faith in the greater Boston area and beyond. We are located at the corner of Arlington and Boylston Streets, across from the Public Garden in Boston, Massachusetts. Please visit ASCBoston.org for more information about this historic Unitarian Universalist congregation. Arlington Street Church, gathered in love and service for justice and peace. Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Leonard Cohen, the Canadian singer, songwriter, and poet, wrote these compelling lyrics in his ballad anthem. As we continue to emerge into our post-pandemic world, I want to share a few lessons that can help us peel away our armor and transform our lives in the hope that we can benefit from these teachings. In 2005, Eugene O'Kelly was at his life's apex. He was CP CEO of KPMG, one of the US's big four accounting firms, having worked his way to the summit after starting as an assistant accountant in 1972. O'Kelly was doing what most global CEOs do, traveling around the world, working an insane schedule, and reveling in the life he had made for himself. He was a consummate type A person. O'Kelly loved his wife and children immensely and was looking forward to spending more time with them after retirement. Then, out of nowhere, O'Kelly started to suffer from headaches and a loss of control over one side of his face. After completing a series of medical tests, he learned that he had an inoperable brain tumor at age 53. The doctors informed him that he had three months to live. His entire life flashed in front of him. Ultimately, O'Kelly recounted the final days of his life in a best-selling book, Chasing Daylight, which I finished a few weeks ago. As an executive whose calendar was typically scheduled out for 18 months, O'Kelly started to plan his death as meticulously as he planned his life. He resolved to do three things. Leave his job, choose a medical protocol that allowed him to make his remaining time as good as it possibly could be for himself and those whom he loved. O'Kelly writes, I was blessed. I was told I had three months to live. Because of the factors surrounding my dying, I took a different approach to my last hundred days, one that required me to keep my eyes as wide open as possible, even with blurred vision. There was one more factor, probably the primary one, that influenced the way I approached my demise, my brain, the way I thought, my sensibilities about work and accomplishment, about consistency and continuity and commitment, were so ingrained in me from my professional life and had served me so well in that life that I couldn't imagine not applying them to my final task. I was a lucky guy. O'Kelly started to manage the spiritual work of coming to terms with what he called his transition. One of the highest priorities was to unwind the relationships with his most valuable connections. He made a list of everyone who was important to him, beginning with his family and continuing until he had amassed a list of 1,000 personal and professional contacts. Then O'Kelly wrote emails and sent letters to all of these people, informing them of his condition and explaining what their relationship had meant to him. He then scheduled final phone calls or in-person meetings consisting of long walks, meals, and other unique outings with as many people as he could. O'Kelly put great care into creating what he called perfect moments with the people he valued most. 
He made each of these moments deeply personal and memorable for both of them, with the understanding it would be the last time they would see each other. It was extremely difficult and emotional to read O'Kelly's final moments with his loved ones, especially with his daughters, Gina and Marianne, and his wife, Corinne. In his memoir, O'Kelly remarked that these moments were the best days of his life, spent in unique ways with the people most important to him. He concluded that commitment is best measured not by the time one is willing to give up, but more accurately by the energy one wants to put in, by how present one is. As we start to peel away the armor we donned to protect ourselves during the lockdown and pandemic, physical armor, emotional armor, mental armor, and spiritual armor, I see incredible value in the foresight and wisdom O'Kelly offers each of us as a guidebook for reconnecting with the people we cherish most in our lives. Some of us might be thinking about how quickly we can get away and blow some savings on a vacation or luxury items. However, if the pandemic has taught us anything, it is the value of our relationships and how much little things really matter. O'Kelly planned perfect moments with his most beloved relationships, knowing that he did not have many days left to live. I believe we have a unique opportunity to replicate O'Kelly's approach. Personally, I can't think of a better way to start returning to normal than to consider how we can create perfect moments with those who are most important to us. Hopefully, without O'Kelly's added burdens, we can make this the first of many perfect moments to spend together in the future. Whom do you need to create your first perfect moments with? It is a good time to start your list. Joseph Campbell wrote, if you can see your path laid out in front of you step by step, you know it's not your path. Your own path you make with every step you take. That's why it's your path. Brene Brown picks up this urgent need for true belonging in her book, Braving the Wilderness. She writes, True belonging is the spiritual practice of believing in and belonging to yourself so deeply that you can share your most authentic self with the world and find sacredness in both being a part of something and standing alone in the wilderness. True belonging doesn't require you to change who you are. It requires you to be who you are. But in a culture rife with perfectionism and pleasing and with the erosion of civility, it's easy to stay quiet, hide in our ideological bunkers, or fit in rather than show up as our true selves and brave the wilderness of uncertainty and criticism. But true belonging is not something we negotiate or accomplish with others. It's a daily practice that demands integrity and authenticity. It's a personal commitment that we carry in our hearts. Brown argues that we are experiencing a spiritual crisis of disconnection and introduces four practices of true belonging that challenge everything we believe about ourselves and each other. The four practices are people are hard to hate close up, move in. Two, Speak truth to bullshit. Be civil. Three, hold hands with strangers. And my personal favorite, strong back, soft front, wild heart. My journey to becoming Valentina Danielle Rosa began 12 plus years ago. 
Once I committed myself to this quest, I became a card-carrying member of the Wild Heart Club. I think it encapsulates a core tenet of my own spirituality in simple, direct language. And for those of you who I know speak in paragraphs, not mere words, that's quite an accomplishment. Roshi Joan Halifax offers this wisdom. All too often, our so-called strength comes from fear, not love. Instead of having a strong back, many of us have a defended front shielding a weak spine. In other words, we walk around brittle and defensive, trying to conceal our lack of confidence. If we strengthen our backs, metaphorically speaking, and develop a spine that's flexible and sturdy, then we can risk having a front that's soft and open. How can we give and accept with strong back, soft front compassion, moving past fear into a place of genuine tenderness? I believe it comes about when we can be truly transparent, seeing the world clearly and letting the world see us. Strong back, soft front, wild heart calls to mind the importance of balance and alignment in our lives, along with the power of the breath. Both the inhale and the exhale. Living with a wild heart is a lifestyle with incredible rewards of kindness and love juxtaposed against the risks of pain and loss. The mark of a wild heart is living the paradox of love in our lives. It's the ability to be tough and tender, excited and scared, brave and afraid, all in the same moment. It's showing up in our vulnerability and our courage, being both fierce and kind. It's our, about our willingness to peel away our armor, to take in the messy world and give back with gratitude, joy, and compassion. My dearly beloveds, I have a spiritual practice of singing Debbie Friedman's Misha Berach every day. Misha Berach has a beautiful Hebrew melody and powerful Hebrew and English language lyrics. The prayer takes its name from two Hebrew words, me and Sheberach, meaning the one who blessed. After singing this prayer, I first recite the names of family and friends in need of healing, and then the names of those who have died until their one year anniversary. In closing, I would like to sing Mishaberach for you. My apologies if my singing voice causes your ears to tingle or the hair to stand up on the back of your neck. If you feel comfortable, I encourage you to close your eyes so the melody and words resonate in your heart. Me May the source of strength who blessed the ones before us help us find the courage to make our lives a blessing and let us say ah Me 
widows in need of healing with Rafua Shlema. The renewal of body, the renewal of spirit, and let us say, Ah. And now, for our closing words, I invite you to put your hands over your heart in Namaste. I bow to the divine in you. Our closing words come from Brene Brown. True belonging is the spiritual practice of believing in and belonging to yourself so deeply that you can share your most authentic self with the world and find sacredness in both being a part of something and standing alone in the wilderness. True belonging doesn't require to change who you are. It requires you to be who you are. Let us keep this faith, beloveds, and carry it on. The service begins when the service ends. Amen. Where you go, where you go, I will go, beloved. Where you go, I will go. Where you go, I will go, beloved. Where you go, I will go. Please visit ASCBoston.org for more information about this historic Unitarian Universalist congregation. Arlington Street Church, gathered in love and service for justice and peace.